onto our experiences. And then in turn, together, we have some, say, agreements that we all make that say this thing that we're interacting with is like this. For example, one agreement that we have is the economy is really important and we need to work as hard as we can to make sure that it's benefiting the top 1%. That's one agreement that we somehow have gotten ourselves into. Another agreement might be table, right? And all the functions that we give a table. Now this is objective agreements. Subjective agreements are what does this table emotionally mean to you? How do you emotionally relate to it? Because this is what's going to come up first. Because before, this is just raw sensory data. You know, like the Buddhists said, um, you know, everything is emptiness. This is said that everything is devoid of meaning. There is no inherent meaning really in anything. The meaningfulness that we interact with on a normal basis within the human experience is a construction. That doesn't just say it's valueless, but it's not necessarily the ultimate reality. The way that we interpret this random, seemingly random sensory data and construct it into what we believe or what we agree upon is according to a certain set of models. Models, paradigms, in the book I use the term languages, whatever. But I'm going to use model for this time. We have certain models that we apply to. For example, we have the model of materialism that many of us are indoctrinated into seeing our experiences through, wherein the acquisition of material items is the highest level of emotional meaningfulness, for example. Or maybe the model of American-style democracy, or the model of partisanship, or the model of Christianity, or the model of Islam, or the model of uh, being a Buddhist. Right? These are all models that we utilize to make sense of this random data and to help us sort of construct the meaningfulness that we'll interact with, because that's what we do. We're meaningful, meaningfulness generating creatures as humans. Now, this gets really interesting when we start to apply it to experiences that are far beyond what we would normally experience in our daily life, right? When we find ourselves experiencing something extremely novel, so novel that we have no framework or model for whatsoever before we enter it. For example, the psychedelic experience. We'll like reach to whatever information we have to make sense of this experience, right? Since we don't normally talk about it. But just because we're not talking about something doesn't mean that we're not being fed a model or a paradigm in some way. So the models and paradigms we're being fed about say psilocybin mushrooms, but drugs in general, is that, well, they're bad. They're bad, they're wrong, they're not allowed, well, except for coffee and cigarettes and alcohol, as long as you don't have too much, but by it, it's Friday. And TV, which isn't really a drug, but it does make you go zombie-like and numb and sit in front of the couch and then have withdrawal symptoms, but it's not a drug. Sugar does have a drug. But the other drugs, they're bad drugs, such as cannabis, we all know how awful cannabis is, right? right? Psilocybin, LSD, DMT, I'm not sure you know, but like other ones that maybe aren't so constructive, like heroin, unless it's in a hospital, which, by the way, you can prescribe heroin a lot easier than you can prescribe psilocybin. It's an interesting point, right? We're given this idea that these certain drugs that we've really clearly defined according to the legal system are bad. This is one of the models we so what happens when a drug is bad before you even go into it? All drugs are bad. Well, you're doing a bad thing, you can't exactly do it responsibly, can you? So you want to get trapped. This is a problem, especially among youth. Because we have a bunch of young people going in and taking drugs. They're gonna do it, no matter what. Stan Scroft, check this guy out, Stan Scroft says, you know, the desire to experience ecstatic states of consciousness is on the same level of one's desire to experience a sexual experience. You're gonna go there. You know, you think you're gonna stop a teenager from having sex? No. You teach them about safe sex. You think you're gonna stop them from taking drugs? Probably not. You teach them about how they can be used responsibly if they choose to take it. But no, we teach them that it's bad. There's another thing that we teach, and that's marginalization. They're not really anything special anyways. Don't worry about it. So if you don't identify with mushrooms or bad, maybe you identify with the other model. That model is it's not really a big deal. Drink them, go to the, or uh, sorry, eat them up, drink some beers, go to the woods, have a laugh. 
go to the club, whatever, go to the dance party, get super high, see things all moving around, talk to trees, whatever. It's no big deal. Now these are kind of like, these are the models that we have in conventional society. At least that's the ones that are, that are most prevalent right now in conventional Western society. But there are other models. There's one that's beaming up right now, which is really beautiful. And that's like the academic model. Where they're going in and they're having experience, they're, sorry, they're doing studies through guys like Charles Grove and Roland Rippus and Robin Carhart Harris, who we're going to talk about some of this work in a bit. They're coming out and they're saying, wow, this stuff is occasioning mystical type experiences. This stuff is fundamentally changing people's personalities from adults, changing their personalities like long term for the better. This is allowing people to go into the experience terrified of their own impending death within like a couple months of terminally ill cancer and coming up the other end saying, I've come to terms with my death. I can enjoy life now and be a support system for my family as I go through this transition. This is what the academic model is like. Unfortunately, our culture isn't exactly inspired to move forward by new advances in science and immersion. Mostly because a lot of the science out there is being funded by the very same people we don't trust anymore because they're destroying the earth. <laughs> that's not a denounce on science, unfortunately, it's a denounce on our cultural values. Another model that we have accessible that's a little bit fringe is sort of like the really poetic one. Right? So, I, I don't know, if you want to envision it like a cross or something, it doesn't matter. But like a really poetic one, right? say, the model of Terence McKenna, which is beautiful, but like really fringe. But the models that people present about, you know, like um, cascading light patterns echoing from the edges of the universe, touching and caressing my entire body at its core until I was lifted into the cosmos, and yada yada. They're very beautiful and very poetic, but like, you know, like, are, is my parents going to understand that when I try to explain it to them? You know, if they haven't had that type of experience? Is that going to make the potential benefits that whatever that crazy poetic experience was for you accessible to somebody else when you say, hey, I had this experience that helped me in some way. Probably not. For the most part, it alienated people. Right? When you start telling people, you know, self-driven machine elves, and I like Terrence McKenna, I'm supporting him, I'm just like using him as an example, it's popular, right? Then what you're going to do is offer a language, a model, rhetoric, that within discourse is going to make people feel kind of alienated. If you're not already in the group, you know, if you're not around, already in the know, then you're probably not going to be interested because it confuses you. Because most people haven't had experiences of cascading light patterns that go through their core or something, right? So, and also, a point to that is, then when you enter that experience, if all you've got to say is you've evaded this one, if you've evaded this one, and you don't think that it's bad or marginalized, you don't necessarily like see it through a really clinical eye that this is all the poetry, but you're going with this like machine out experience, what are you gonna get? Your model is gonna constrain that down into the very thing that you already agreed that you're going into experience, which is machine out, which is beautiful and cool, but it doesn't really apply in your daily life, does it? You can't really use these things as tools to heal, as I'm gonna outline here in a bit, tools to heal mental emotional patterns that are causing deleterious effects on your quality of life if when you're coming out all you got was machine elves. It doesn't really apply. <coughs> so we've got one other model, right? Or one other, I'm so generalizing right now, but we have another model, and that's like the indigenous model. Spirit medicines, you know, food of the gods, right? Jaguar spirit, whatever you can think of for the indigenous model, which is beautiful and I think grounded in a really important truth which is these things have value, which earns them reverence. But the issue there is that if you choose to identify with this model so you can gain this reverence, then you have to first kind of like absorb some of those assumptions about what the indigenous or shamanic paradigm or model says about the world, says about the nature of your experience. Say so maybe you need to go to the jungle to have this experience, right? But in the jungle, the shaman tells you it needs to be like this and like this with these spirits and animal guides and this and that. And then you come back to your life in Kitchener, Ontario. And how does that apply? You know, like how do you share that with your loved ones? That you're going through an experience that, you know, according to all this shamanic language, and they don't understand. And again, you feel alienated, they feel alienated. 
eventually you can't apply the healed, healthy self you earned in the jungle into your daily life here because they don't connect, they don't overlap. Because the jungle paradigm doesn't apply here. Do you guys follow me on all this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? So then what do we do? We need to define a new model. We need to find a model that offers the substance reverence, the reverence it deserves, okay? That totally acknowledges that everyone's talking about marginalization and it being bad, because if you ignore what's happening, you'll never be able to change, make, make changes. It applies the scientific understanding, because if we are gonna be so arrogant to think that just because a group of people in a certain culture are making really shitty choices, or being ignorant in some way, that we should throw out something as full as science so that we can focus on only spirituality. I think that we're making a horrible mistake. This is the updated human knowledge base. If we're going to be building a model to explain something so novel and interesting, we need to get all of it, including the science and including the poetry. We need a model that fits in the center, that is in full recognition of how it's being talked about, that offers it the fullest reverence that we can offer it, that's based in science and expressed poetically that doesn't alienate people, right? And when we do this, if that's the model, if that's the model that you guys have before you go into your experience and you're like, oh, I have this premise of how I can work with this substance to better my life directly here and now moving forward in my community and share and talk to other people about it, that's gonna benefit you a lot more than machine elves or just like conventional psychotherapy or going to the jungle or whatever you're gonna to choose to do if you think it's bad or nothing special. So that's why I wrote my book. <laughs> so this is my book. I feel like it's weird. Maybe I want to stand on the side for a couple minutes. I'll switch back and forth. So this is a new conceptual model. It's not new in a sense that I made all this stuff up from nothing, right? But it's new in a sense that it's piecing things together in a way that hasn't been pieced together before. So this is like one of the most amounts of text you're going to read on any given bit. But like I said, it explores the psilocybin experience as it relates to psychospiritual maturation and mental emotional healing. This means to say that it talks about the psychedelic experience of magic mushrooms according to a model that says, hey, these things can help us develop as confident, mature adults more in line with the deepest core of ourselves, which is our spirit. And we're going to go into more in a second. It focuses deeply on the idea of facing the shadow because one of the most detrimental experiences that psychedelics can offer is the bad trip. Has anyone here had a bad trip? Okay. Did you think that you needed to have that bad trip? Well, let me, let me offer you a new language. Was it bad? Like bad, like naughty? No. No. <laughs> Difficult. Difficult. Paranoid. Hard. Pardon? Paranoid. Paranoid. That's, uh, to me, that's kind of bad. But like, <laughs> yeah. But like, challenging. A hard trip. We go into this experience with, again, one of these models that says, careful for the bad trip. <clears throat> Anytime it's not happy, fun, go lucky, butterflies and machine elves, it's a bad trip. What happens then? We stress out. We don't want a bad trip. Who wants to go through that? We've been told that it's awful. It's a nightmare. So we create resistance and anxiety. And then we have these really negative experiences of emotionally amplified anxiety, which results in minor levels of post-traumatic stress disorder. And then you have people who will spend the rest of their lives and you're like, yeah, you know, like, went out and took mushrooms last week and they're like, whoa, mushrooms? Yeah, I did that once. I can't do that ever again. There's like the panic, this fear. And I've talked with people that feel as though that's actually a really negative thing for a person's development as a person if they go in and have a bad trip resistance and create post-traumatic stress because of a really tender soft spot of themselves that was being exposed got shut down hard and a whole lot of like guards and tension came up to protect it even though that's the very bit that you want to learn out. We'll get into that more too. It outlines the conceptualization of reality and the psychological mechanisms of action that generate meaningfulness within the human experience. So this book isn't just about mushrooms, right? And this talk isn't just about mushrooms. Obviously, we're talking about society, we're talking about the nature of reality, right? And in the book, I outline 
how it is that we conceptualize our experiences according to what the implication of the psilocybin experience may be leading us to consider. And it seemed to be very, uh, seemed to correlate very strongly with a lot of ancient religious practices or beliefs, especially Buddhism. Now, this book is, the ideas that I had are personally ex experiential, so I actually had these experiences, right? So I'm not saying in any way that it's universal, that these are your experiences, and this is what you're going to go through, and it's just like this with all of these steps. Now, this, like, this is what I cultivated as an understanding of my personal experience, and a whole lot of study, and piecing together objective agreements, as well as subjective meaningfulness, to construct this model. And if it applies for you, please take it with you. If something in it doesn't apply, leave it behind. And that's true. Like I said, not intended to be universal or definite. And why am I doing this? Because I feel new models can help enable the effective navigation and integration of psychedelic experiences, which in my opinion, and I have a really strong feeling that a lot of you here have a similar opinion, the psychedelic experience has a lot to offer us right now as a species on this planet, going through probably some of the hardest challenges that we've come through since like, the fall of the Roman Empire. Except the difference is that instead of it just being a bunch of buildings falling down, instead of it just being a bunch of buildings falling down, it's going to be the total collapse of the Earth's integrity in some ways. Now, I can't see, I can't see what I have coming up next. Normally I can, so you have to pardon me if I have to skip back and jump forward. But within this model, I feel as if psilocybin mushrooms can be used as a tool. This isn't to say that they're not like a friend, if you want to use that language, or like a, an ally or something, but that they're functional. They're not just like a, they're not just something that you take, they're not this marginalized description, they're not necessarily like gods or something, but they're a tool, they're functional. And we can use them to functionally release from retroactive emotional patterns. This means to say that it allows us to go back into the source of whatever emotional disturbances we have or wounds we have embedded inside of us that cause us to act out in weird ways within our personality, like uh, passive aggressiveness or being aloof or being aggressive directly or like getting upset about this one specific thing or like being abusive or, or whatever negative or detrimental personality things that we have are actually like the defense mechanism to protect from emotional wounds that develop and strengthen over time. They almost like precipitate out of these wounds. And we could try to deal with our personality issues and try to create change there, but that's like trying to like, it's just like swatting at the branch. Instead of getting down to the root of what's actually going on there, which is an emotional wound that's probably to some degree sourced all the way back to pre operational childhood, because none of our parents were the Buddhas, and none of their parents were the Buddhas either. So we've got a long lineage of wounds that each generation we exacerbate or heal through to discover new ones, for our children to exacerbate or heal through and discover new ones. So when we take psilocybin mushrooms, our emotional potency, the level by which we emotionally relate to our experiences, or the level by which we, I, we experience emotion in their raw state, is turned up really strong. I feel as though this is what they're doing. They're really turning up the emotional potency of our experiences. That's why, that's why you get that crazy laughter that lasts for an hour sometimes. Right? That's why you're absolutely ravaged by fear, because you're having a bad trip. It's because the emotions are turned up really, really strong. Our ability to rationalize out of that is kind of like deteriorated away. Not just like psychologically, but neurologically, and we're going to talk about that in a second. When we go into these places, into these, like say we go down into the root of whatever emotion it might be, whether it be happy or sad, and we're fully in it and we allow ourselves to express it and surrender, which is one of the four archetypes, then it allows us to release that emotion. And when we release that emotion, we're given an opportunity to relate to it differently. We are given the opportunity to, for a moment, use a exogenous, catalyst, that means something that catalyzes from outside of us, something that creates action, okay, 
we can use an exogenous catalyst to dissolve the mental emotional patterns we have stored subconsciously that tell us to continuously and repeatedly act this way according to these emotions because of this past wound. We dissolve those patterns away for a time. We can go deep into this emotional experience. We can release it out and we can cultivate a broader self-awareness, which is my third point here. Which goes to say that we get to have a direct conscious experience of something that's happening deep inside of us, way below our normal conscious mind, which if we have a model that gives it reverence and direct applicability, we can carry forth into our personal identity or self-identity and into our lives moving forward, the way we interact with ourselves, with events unfolding around us, and the way we interact with other people. We are able to really get an understanding of the dark aspects of who we are. We live in a world, do you guys notice this? We live in a world where the TV, mostly, but then we have a whole lot of people who are unconscious soldiers for the television culture telling us what to think as well. We're being told that bad experiences, dark, uncomfortable emotions, those aren't good. You don't want them. Happiness is key. And if you buy this new Audi, you'll have that happiness. So sell out all your friends to get it. But happiness is key. Don't ever feel sadness, because all sadness are signs of illness and depression. Right? Now this is an ex I'm like a, I'm really creating like an extreme like caricature of this, but it it's happened. And then at the same time, as we're being told, don't feel the bad feelings, they're sick, only feel happiness, we're being constantly inundated with fear. Right? The economic situation is gonna collapse, you know, like chemical weapons in Syria or whatever, you know, like bus exploded down the streets, people are dying, famine, awful, yada yada, and they're doing so in a way that never actually gives you a sense of solace to understand what's happening, just that there's reason to be afraid. The news, those news channels, especially that like CP24 thing, they're just constantly feeding you reasons to be afraid and never giving you enough information to feel grounded in knowing what's actually happening. And so you have this unconscious fear going all the time, but you're not allowed to feel it. Because fear and sadness is bad. Don't talk about it in public. Don't reveal your real feelings. Happiness is the way to go. We all need to be business professional robots. This is the way we need to live life. This is the idea. That's, that's not very good for us, though, is it? So when we go into these places with psilocybin, we can dissolve away the patterns that have unconsciously told us that we need to act this way. Stop acting that way for a time, go into those emotions, feel them to their fullest, get an understanding that, yeah, I feel sadness, like wretched sadness, and yes, I feel alone, awful, awful loneliness, and life is not easy, and that's okay. Because you come up the other end and you go, yeah, I felt these things, and I feel confident and courageous in knowing that, yes, I have those, and yes, I can deal with it. Because I was there by myself in the woods, under the moon, in the dark, feeling it and dealing with it, and I'm still here, right? And then when we come back from these experiences, we've cultivated psycho-spiritual maturity. Okay, so I said spirit. However you want to walk away from here, whatever you have right now, as your idea of what spirit and spirituality is, I'm not trying to confront it or challenge it in any way. I'm just going to offer you what I mean when I say spirituality. Okay? When I say spirit, I mean the core center of your being, not like the physical center, but the core center of your being, the expression of you, the expression of self that is unhindered and unconditioned, the one that sits underneath all the wounds of all the guards, the one that's so tender and beautiful and expressive. Like this is your core, this is your spirit, where spirituality or spiritual practice is the means by which we're cultivating a connection to them. Right? You guys follow me on this? Mm -hmm. Psycho-spiritual maturation is the um, developmental process by which we become more consciously aware of our deepest core self. And thus we can confidently apply it to our lives. <coughs> Now, I said deepest core self, and I want it to be clear that it doesn't matter to me, really, how you want to take that, whether or not you want to take it as just the individual, 
or if you want to take that even deeper into the concepts of like God or absolute infinity or whatever, it doesn't necessarily matter. But the point is, is that with the use of this tool, we can cultivate or catalyze the type of experiences that allow us to dissolve the unconscious boundaries, dissolve the unconscious patterns that prevent us from going deep into the fullest emotional expression of our core self, whether it be damaged or wound and be healing, or vibrant and expressive, and it allows us to do so in a way that gives us a fuller understanding of who we are, so we can step forward as more psycho-spiritually mature beings. And the more of those we have, I think the better off we're going to be as a species. So these are the four archetypes I'm going to switch sides. So surrender, facing the shadow, <coughs> uncovering the true self, and oneness. How many of you guys can relate to these words? Great, that's like a lot. Surrender. Now, actually, before I go into this board, these, each one of these, they're not independent of each other in any way. I don't think that these are separate experiences. Like you can say, this is an experience where I'm learning surrender. This is a true self. 